Welcome, welcome, one and all, to uh, the Anapanasati uh, class, the Awakening Breath, where we will be looking at uh, the Anapanasati Sutta and going through the 16 exercises of Anapanasati. Uh, so as I was mentioning a little bit before I started to record, um, you know, I started this meditation practice some decades ago. And uh, one of the first things that I started to work with was the breath. And I found that just the practice on its own outside of scholarly teaching and teachers and community and all of these wonderful resources that we have available today, uh, just um, placing our focus in a particular way with a particular intention can begin to unleash a particular uh, process, a process of growth, uh, a process of healing, a process of integration, a process of uh, ironing out uh, some of our rough edges, a process of relinquishing some of our, uh, how shall we say, uh, unconscious patterns of reactivity that are, are based in a lot of uh, discontent. Um, so, you know, I was saying uh, earlier that um, I feel very um, duty bound uh, for all the years that I found myself kind of adrift and gro uh, groping around in the dark uh, to try to, um, pay it forward as it were, to try to provide as much kind of information and support I can in terms of this practice. Uh, so the simple act of attending to our breath um, can be quite life-changing. Uh, so thank you for everybody that shared earlier what your uh, interest and curiosities and experiences are. Uh, there's a, a fair number of people here who have a good amount of experience under their breath, <laughs> under their belt, uh, about working with the breath. And um, I look forward to hearing about everybody's experiences here. Um, so uh, let me go off into the blackboards here. Um, okay, so bear with me as I um, get this all up and ready. One more time. Let me see if I can get this going. Here we go. Okay. All right. Everybody can see this relatively okay? Michael, yes. I have a question. I think will, that's Lori. Will, will you be putting this on um, Google Classroom? Uh, would, that, would that be appreciated? Would you like to have access to these on a Google Classroom? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. F the eyes have it. So uh, this, Thank you. this, folks, I will be creating a Google Classroom uh, uh, for uh, this series, and I will be putting up these uh, slides um, and other resources. Yeah, I think that's particularly appropriate for this, this series, since there's a lot of kind of other supportive materials that I think um, would be good. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. Okay, so awakening breath, Anapanasati. So class one, we're gonna be looking a little bit at the history uh, of practice, and then we're gonna be delving into the first tetrad as it were. So uh, going into it, um, what, what is this experience here of Anapanasati? If you've ever sat and meditated and had the experience of, or heard the instruction, go back to your breath, um, you know, we can argue that this is where it comes from. Uh, Anapanasati, uh, roughly translated, mindfulness of breath. Um, so I'm going to be uh, referencing Majjhima Nikaya uh, 118. Uh, that's the Anapanasati Sutta. So to set the scenes, where 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 is this practice? Where does it come from? You know, for anybody who's a, a, a sutta file, somebody who likes to study uh, or read some of the earlier texts um, of the Buddha from the Pali Canon, uh, there's a lot of how should we say a lot of the directions, a lot of the uh, stuff that he gives varies uh, depending on the context, uh, who he's talking to, what's the larger aim of the conversation. So a lot of the, um, how should we say, meditative instructions are rather um, vague, open-ended, um, and you know might be directed towards other, how should we say, um, 
contexts, you know, depending on, on each, each sutta as a different theme. So this, uh, this is one of the uh, suttas that stands alone as Buddha giving very, very deliberate uh, instruction on meditation practice. Um, so to set the stage where he gave this particular discourse, uh, he's sitting with the monks during a particular rains retreat. So um, here he is uh, in, uh, you know, South Asia, uh, prone to rain season, uh, you know, good on average three months out of the year where there is uh, particularly a lot of rain. Uh, and traditionally, the monks would uh, find a place to wait out the rain season. And it became a period of time of uh, deep introspection, prolonged uh, meditation. So the rains retreat uh, was a thing. Uh, it's uh, three months of, um, of dedicated practice. So uh, one time on a particular rains retreat, they're coming towards the end of it. And Buddha is just saying, wow, man, you, you guys rock. You guys, this is particularly awesome. Um, as the, the sutta goes, I have heard that on one occasion, the Blessed One was staying at Sabati in the Eastern Monastery, the palace of Megara's mother, together with many well-known elder disciples, with Venerable Sariputta, Venerable Maha Magalana, Venerable Maha Kasapa, Venerable Maha Kachana, Venerable, and the list of the Venerables goes on. It's kind of the, the who's who of big names of, um, of the monkhood uh, back in the day. And Essentially, uh, uh, it says now on that occasion, uh, the Opasatta day of the 15th, the full moon night of the Pavarana ceremony. So there's this ceremony that, um, you know, everybody's been sitting together for three months. Probably, you know, it's a relatively confined space. I mean, if there's a lot of people, I mean, this picture shows a large group. So just think of a lot of people just in this uh, commune together. Uh, intentional community, people probably get on each other's nerves. Uh, so there's this particular ceremony of, um, you know, just dealing with the conflict among the community where people atone for offenses made during the time. Um, so it's a time of kind of just healing and people kind of, I guess, yeah, atoning for their actions. Uh, so the uh, Opasata day, it's the day of cleansing the defiled mind. So it's a day of really intensified practice. So this is the scene uh, that's going on. So I have this kind of, I like this forest picture. It kind of gives you an idea of maybe what it could look like. Uh, so the Buddha uh, is just very content. He's just talking about, wow, you guys are awesome. You guys are amazing. You know, there's so many monks here that are just progressing along. You know, there are a lot of arhats here or very liberated uh, uh, monastics. And there are the ones under them who are, you know, uh, 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 working di diligently towards their liberation and, and all the, the monks who are more um, advanced are helping the, the other monastics move along. And so there's this great harmony and great diligence in the practice. And so Buddha essentially says, hey man, let's keep this party going. Let's extend this uh, rains retreat by another month. Yeah. And he says, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you this practice to work on, to focus on for this next month. Uh, and then he goes off into this discourse uh, and where he, he lists out uh, 16 very specific exercises uh, for the meditation practice. Uh, so he gives the discourse on mindfulness of breath. Um, so here is one section of that uh, where he says, in and out Breathing is developed and pursued so as to bring the four frames of reference to their culmination. The four frames of reference are developed and pursued so as to bring the seven factors of awakening to their culmination. The seven factors for awakening are developed and pursued so as to bring clear knowing and release to their culmination. So he's talking about this progression, a progression that happens in the practice. So earlier I was saying, just by placing our attention on the breath, it unleashes this process. So what he's talking about is four frames of reference. Some people might have, uh, are more familiar with the term of the four foundations of mindfulness. Um, I know that that's uh, uh, had a, a, a resurgence in the last couple of years. A lot of people are, are distinctly uh, going into writing about teaching kind of traditionally the uh, four foundations of mindfulness, working with the body, with feeling tone, with the mind and the dhammas. 
And those are essentially kind of four categories that we can direct our focus towards, you know, cultivate our relationship with a specific object of focus, yeah. Uh, and uh, in response, we're developing certain skill sets. And so what he's saying here is, yes, if we meditate in this way, working with the four foundations of mindfulness or the four frames of reference, uh, it develops, uh, well, these seven factors for awakening. Yeah, what does that mean? There's a lot of technical jargon here, but the seven factors of awakening, mental factors, like if we're, if we're to take the enlightened mind and take a snapshot of what are the ingredients of, what is the subjective experience of the awakened mind? Uh, it's the presence of, of very specific qualities of mind, you know, you know mindfulness, uh, uh, qualities of investigation and qualities of energy, the uh, qualities of a, a joyfulness, qualities of a tranquility, uh, qualities of, um, of concentration, qualities of equanimity. And so oftentimes I, I refer to this metaphor of the chef tasting the soup and is able to just kind of discern what the ingredients are, what it, you know, what it needs a little more of, what it needs a little less of. And so in this way, part of what we're doing in maturing a mindfulness practice is being able to just take a taste or a sample of our subjective experience, uh, uh, take a taste of what the mind is and have a sense of, oh, okay, there's maybe a little too much craving and aversion going on. Maybe there's not sufficient amount of concentration and tranquility. How is it that we can kind of even the score? Yeah, how is it that we can balance these things out? So he's talking about how the uh, working with the four foundations of mindfulness is a way that we can be able to cultivate this way of training and cultivating the mind. Uh, and for what purpose? To bring together this clear knowing and release, you know? a clear, deep understanding of what this subjective experience is and what it is that we need to relinquish in terms of whatever fixation or grasping we have uh, that is creating that sense of dukkha or how should we say, uh, discontent uh, that seems to just be kind of leeching into our subjective experience in each moment. So there's this progression. Uh, we're working with these uh, um, mindfulness of breath, but there's a way that it leads organically towards kind of the full experience of awakening. So uh, as I said, uh, mindfulness and distinct practices, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, mindfulness of the body, of the feel tone, of the mind, the dhammas, or the mental factors, those ingredients of the soup. And what I like about the Anapanasati practice, I'll use this taking the bus metaphor. Um, uh, as uh, uh, Genevieve was saying earlier, yeah, it's a little restrictive, some of these exercises. But yes, it, it is. Um, you know, I, I'll use a metaphor, another metaphor on top of the metaphor, of kind of cross-training at a gym. It's just like, okay, now we're going to do some kind of warm up here, stretching. Now we're going to do some cardio. Now we're going to do some strength training. And it's just like, well, wait, all these exercises are different. But yeah, there's a progression. We can see how they all lend to an overall sense of uh, physical health. In this way, the 16 exercises, they're, they're rather specific, but it's like Buddha's taking like a, a needle and thread, and he's just kind of threading them all together so we can see how one leads into the next, leads into the next, and how they all kind of be, serve to support each other, uh, uh, to ultimately create this more uh, broadened, uh, uh, awakened experience of mind. So the taking the bus metaphor is if I'm, you know, up here uh, in way, way uber northern um, uh, valley, and I want to go downtown, I, you know, there's not going to be one bus that gets me there. I have to take one bus to a stop, switch, get on another bus that takes me there, another bus gets me there. Yeah. So there's a sense of kind of switching. So in a way, yes, we're going to be going through these different exercises, working with these different objects of focus, these different categories of working of the body, of feeling to own mind and the dhammas. And it's just like we're kind of doing the bus exchange until we get to our destination. So I just wanted to kind of offer that there. Um, another thing that we're doing, so I, right now I'm, I'm trying to kind of give the, the, the broad view. So um, uh, hopefully this will kind of resonate. You don't have to know or memorize all of this for sure, uh, but uh, if this helps. Uh, mindfulness, you might've heard the term. Um, I remember reading, you know, the, the early, uh, um, uh, early uh, um, science, the early 
reports coming in where they define mindfulness as an open choiceless awareness, moving right along. And I, I never, I don't like that. I don't like that uh, definition. Uh, I don't use that. Um, I find that very um, nebulous. Um, mindfulness in the way that the Buddha is talking here, um, in terms of what is being cultivated by working with the mindfulness of breath, of what's being worked with in cultivating the four foundations of mindfulness. Again, that idea of the, the needle and thread threading together, we're cultivating specific sets or aspects of the practice of meditation. And we're developing these skills. So right now what I'm talking about is uh, the skill sets that begin to become cultivated in us. So we're starting off, uh, what we're gonna be doing today is the first tetrad, working with uh, um, Kayana Anupasana, or uh, 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 tracking uh, the breath in, uh, in the body, yeah? being with the mindfulness of breath in the body. And so that's all about shamatha, or what does that mean? It's the calming, cooling component of meditation. When we sit to meditate and we connect with the breath and there's some sense of ease, there's some sense of relief that happens. You know, that's the shamatha component we're cultivating the sense of the freneticness and urgency that we might carry with us begins to ease and cool off. That's the shamatha component. The sense of the mind beginning to focus, come together and settle. That's the shamatha component. So the shamatha is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people here who have uh, various degrees of practice, you know, you, you sit, you get a little calm, a little concentrated, it's a little light and pleasant, you know, a lot of people might have experience in this way, the shamatha. Yeah. Now then later on, as we continue on with the practice, um, it gets more into the vipassana or the insight, you know, where we begin to kind of take that camera, turn it 180 degrees around and really begin to uh, introspect a little self-inquiry into what is creating the sense of I am, what is creating the sense of uh, uh, my subjectivity in this moment. And what is it that I'm grasping onto that's giving me that? Yeah. And how is it that I can begin to uh, 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 let go of that, become liberated from that, so to speak. So uh, we start to get you know, insight into you know, uh, the disidentification from our own process of, of stress, uh, you know, the anatta. We begin to gain insight into the impermanence of our subjective experience and how that helps to facilitate uh, release and awakening, uh, and so on. So that vipassana, that deep uh, uh, wisdom insight component begins to become an, uh, 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 developed. And the way that I argue is necessary, although it's not explicitly said within the text, the, the way that I work with the vipassana and the shamatha, there's this meta component. And so for, again, forgive these uh, poly terminology, but the metta, that's the cultivating of the heart, cultivating of the, the various uh, attributes, the various um, uh, uh, altruistic expressions of the heart. How is it that we can bring the sense of uh, uh, kindness, uh, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity into each moment? Um, I find that those are also uh, necessary components to really kind of lean into and mature the vipassana and the shamatha. So these are kind of very specific flavors of practice uh, that we begin to develop as, as time moves forward within this. And if, you know, not to overcomplicate things, but we can see how they can dovetail together. Sometimes, you know, as we're developing this practice, this is like, oh, well, sometimes I'm kind of distinctly leaning into the calm and cooling, but there's also this kind of deep insight practice that's happening together. So they're dovetailing together of the Shamatha Vipassana, they're dovetailing the Metta Vipassana, dovetailing the Metta Shamatha, they all kind of work together. I mean, whenever we're really leaning into just calming, cooling, settling in, there's some background awareness of, oh, okay, these are some hindrances, these are some um, agitating qualities that need to be quelled or neutralized or equanimized. You know, that's the Vipassana part, having some insight in breaking our identification with it. That's the meta response of rather than cultivating a craving and aversion towards whatever agitating quality, instead of bringing this acceptance, this equanimity that tends to neutralize it. You know? So really whenever we're working with one practice, the other practices are there as well. So when I look at mindfulness in the context of what Buddha is asking or suggesting 
is happening to us, the way that we're, we'll grow and cultivate these very specific flavors of, of um, these very specific skill sets begin to become um, uh, 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 cultivated within us. So I just wanted to spotlight that um, for those of you for whom these terms are new, you can totally forget about it. But later on, I might start to kind of reference back to this and then they'll begin to, to make a little bit more sense and have a little bit more meaning. Um, oh. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, um, I uh, get the um, awareness part of the intersection of all these sort of as a, a common uh, goal in, in these different uh, flavors, but not the emptiness. Does that mean oh. to Removal of emptiness, or is it a different kind of uh, de de desired emptiness? Yes. Uh, uh, so thank you. So you don't get the emptiness. So um, uh, when I had the the Buddha quote there from the, the from the Sutta, and he was saying how all the practices ultimately serve for a clear knowing and a release, mm -hmm. and 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 I guess that's my kind of shorthanding of that experience. One moment, you know, I might ha have this kind of egoic structure, this sense of self that's organized around some discontent. I'm holding on to some anxiety or some uh, 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 sadness or some negative belief about myself. I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable. It's my fault. Uh, I'm, I'm a screw up. You know, these deep beliefs that we hold on to, these deep um, mm -hmm. negative cognitions, et cetera, um, we can formulate a whole sense of self around that. Uh, and so part of the the anatta or the disidentification, the not self practice that comes with the vipassana, we begin to kind of clearly see it for what it is rather than I'm identified with it so much so that I can't see the, 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 the forest through the trees. Rather, it's just like, you know, the term I like uh, uh, is making the subject the object. Oh, I can step back and be like, oh man, I'm totally holding on to this here. Am I clearly being able to see it for what it is? I'm, I also kind of let go of it as well. And so there can be this natural emptying out of our patterns of, uh, of discontent. Uh, so there, that's one particular expression of emptiness, the anatta, the, the, the breaking of our identification with our suffering. Um, and how, well, that can also become a, a place of a meditative abiding as well, where we're just kind of shedding, releasing, relinquishing. Uh, that's one of the exercises in the Tetrad, focusing on the letting go that happens. And so we can abide in this uh, fluid state of shedding, of letting go. Uh, and uh, the experience, uh, well, you know, that can be a sense of relief, of letting go of, of moments of stress. And then that can begin to auger, auger down and, and deepen and mature into, um, uh, you know, some more non-dual experiences of kind of, you know, whenever you hear the terms of merging or oneness, um, you know, that's kind of the, the you know, I, I like the term emptiness to kind of point to that. Um, so, you know, that's like whenever we're, we're really kind of uh, um, emptying out on such that level, you know, that's, that's that uh, a clear knowing and release uh, that uh, Buddha is talking about. So rather than trying to fit that full sentence into the center there, kind of shorthanded it with the um, awareness and emptiness. Does, does, is that completely? Helpful? Okay. Totally. Excellent Thanks. question. Okay, so uh, uh, th this image right here is a reminder for me to uh, take a breath <laughs> and just open it up. Um, any qu any other questions or comments? So thank you. I, I assume that was Jeff talking. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Anybody else have any questions about it? And anything that I might have um, mentioned thus far? Okay, moving right along then. So um, the first tetrad, what does that mean? Um, so as I was saying, working with the body, feel tone, mind, the dhammas, that's the, um, that is the uh, uh, expression, or that's the, um, those are the categories. So each of those categories uh, in the Anapanasati Sutta is called a tetrad uh, because each of those categories has four specific exercises to them. Um, I, I had this impulse like, see, this is what it looks like. I don't know if this is helpful, but 
uh, you know, that's just it right there. If you can see, you know, there's each of these things are numbered. Um, each of those little paragraphs have a little section of four to them. Uh, so this first tetrad, Kayana Anupasana, um, tracking, following the body. Um, so uh, this is uh, quoting the sutta. Breathing in long, one discerns I am breathing in long. Breathing out long, one discerns I am breathing out long. Number two, breathing in short, one discerns I am breathing in short. Breathing out short, one discerns I am breathing out short. Number three, one trains oneself, I will breathe in sensitive to the entire body. One trains themselves, I will breathe out sensitive to the entire body. Number four, one trains themselves, I will breathe in calming bodily fabrication. One trains themselves, I'll breathe out calming bodily fabrication. So, riveting stuff, I know. Uh, I, I promise it gets more nuanced, but this is where we start. Uh, the simple experience of simple contact with breath. Um, so what's interesting in this formulation here, working with the first tetrad, uh, the first two exercises, you know, we can say it, it's, it's um, kind of sensitizing us to the different expressions of breath. You know, sometimes we breathe and it's incredibly long and drawn out. And sometimes that's forced and sometimes that's natural. And, you know, we will just be aware of that lengthiness of breath. Sometimes on its own, the breath can be rather truncated, shortened. Um, you know, I've noticed, uh, uh, you know, quite often sometimes in deeper states of concentration, I feel like I'm not breathing at all. Uh, there's really no discernible breath. It's just so short and, and subtle. So here, uh, what's being pointed out is, let's just be aware of this kind of range and expression of breaths that can happen and how can we just allow. Um, and another way we can look at it is, yeah, it's kind of a bit of a warm up too. What's it like to breathe in and out quite long? What is it like to breathe in and out quite shortly? Um, you know, uh, that can bring up stuff for different people. Short breathing can, a lot of times we can feel anxious like we're not getting enough breath. And maybe that might be a little clue as to, yeah, when we're out in, in during the day, can we be aware of the breath and how that correlates with certain uh, emotional states or um, uh, 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 mental um, structures that we're holding on to. But once we get into number three, it, it's prefaced with one trains themselves or one trains themselves. Um, and so it talks about, okay, now we're specifically trying to look for cultivate a palate to discern specific things. Now breathe in sensitive to the entire body. So the full body of breath um, that can be uh, translated uh, or, or um, uh, uh, that can be, um, yeah, I, I guess that, that can mean different things uh, uh, to different people that interpret that. Um, the entire body of breath, meaning I'm tracking the full in breath and the full out breath and I'm staying with that, you know? So we're, we're staying with um, our contact with breath and not flaking out at any point. Sometimes when we focus with breath, it's like, oh yeah, I focus on the in-breath, but on each out-breath, I kind of go away. Are we present for the pauses in between the breaths? Was that a question there? I'm sorry, I coughed. Let me mute. No worries. Um, so yeah, well, uh, there's that expression or interpretation of being aware of the full cycle of breath. But there's also the, the interpretation of, well, can be, I be aware of the breath as it influences the entirety of the body itself? And then the calming the bodily fabrications, fabrications, that which is created, that which is made. Uh, some people uh, interpret that meaning the breath itself, rather than making the breath very coarse, how can I make the breath very subtle? Uh, other uh, people have interpreted that meaning, like whatever the body is generating, that's throwing up there the aches and the pains, the itches, uh, the restlessness, um, all the various sensations that might want to well, scream for attention, uh, become a distraction. Well, how is it that we can uh, equanimize those? How can we calm those so that we can just stay with the breath? Or conversely, how can we be with the breath in a way that it, it just resonates out into the body so that it quells uh, any, um, how should we say, distraction? So this is the shamatha component that we're focusing on. So the goal 
uh, for this phase of working with the breath is cultivating shamatha, cultivating the calm, abiding, cultivating concentration, uh, easing any sense of urgency rather than, oh, I've got this itch and I need to scratch it or I'm going to die. Well, okay. How so that we can take that urgency out? How can we be present with the sensation, the breath, the influence of it all in a way that kind of calms it down? Uh, part of the idea is in this stage of the practice, how is it that we can make the body a safe uh, and um, pleasant vessel so that we feel okay just hanging out in it so that the mind is not, you know, offering up a better deal uh, for entertainment? Because um, ultimately we turn our attention to the mind, but first it's about kind of grounding in the body and creating this safe uh, a pleasant abiding. Yeah. Any questions on that part? Of course, Mike, I'll, I'll, I'll this, this is, oh, sorry. This is Genevieve. I do have a question um, regarding the fourth, uh, the fourth point. Mm -hmm. um, how does one calm bodily <laughs> fabrications and, and what's the difference between, or not what's the difference, but how do you, how does one practice calming bodily fabrications versus trying to suppress or repress them yes so, and and at the same time without having um an aversive reaction towards whatever's going on in the body yes okay that's the, that's the million dollar question right there <sighs> so thank you for spotlighting that so uh, calming uh, the bodily fabrications there. So if we have an itch, we have a scratch, we have restlessness, we have uh, a, a discomfort in the body. Uh, so part of that, we can look at it in two different ways. Uh, through the lens of what we're doing here is cultivating the breath. And it's not just, some people might have heard me say in the past, we're not merely looking at the... Um, mechanical entering and exiting of air. Uh, though some people might argue that that's the case. Um, I, 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 I don't. Um, we're also looking at what are the pleasant qualities uh, that um, the breath is affording us. And so some people argue, well, that's the next tetrad, that's field tone, working with the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Um, but right from the beginning, the more that we can kind of lean into those pleasant qualities that the breath can give, uh, that increases our shamatha and it decreases the urgency. So part of it is about what's being cultivated by attending to the breath in this way, where we're increasing this sense of well-being and ease. So whatever agitating sensation becomes less loud, less noisy, less demanding. So there's that part. Uh, and also there's the part where we can literally tend to that experience. Um, so how is it that we can uh, uh, as you were saying, rather than having this experience of, oh, this is so unpleasant, I hate it, just go away. And, and we're cultivating this aversion towards it. You know, can we consciously cultivate this equanimity, this openness, this acceptance, this non-interference of our experience? So this is, you know, a bodily fabrication is forming. Okay, you know, can we allow that to be there? And sometimes um, just by kind of zooming in and being with it, in such a, a way that we're so kind of close, this, this awareness kind of penetrates into that sensation, bringing this kind of equanimity acceptance into it. So in a way it might kind of break it up, make it dissipate. Or sometimes, you know, the focusing away strategy of just being with what we're cultivating with the breath might just kind of retroactively in the background begin to um, have a similar effect of neutralizing or, or quantizing it. So whether we're actively looking and kind of doing a whack-a-mole <laughs> of equanimizing the bodily fabrications or in the background, you know, just focusing on the pleasant qualities and it might begin to uh, soothe it. Uh, but either way, um, you know, let's be aware of the various hindrances, the, the aversion towards what is, the craving for a better experience that we want, uh, the unconsciousness or tendency to go off into mind. You know? Rather, how is it that we can be present with um, and ideally, you know, of these pleasant qualities, we can be cultivating this, this equanimity. Um, does that sound somewhat relevant or sufficient, Genevieve, to the question that you had there? Yes, thank you. Yeah, of, of course, you know, easier said than done. Absolutely, for sure. And hopefully that's what, you know, that's going to be 
part of the ongoing conversation that we're gonna be having throughout this. Cause a lot of this pattern that we see throughout the, the 16 exercises is sensitize yourself to this, know it, experience it. Now, how can we equanimize it? You know, so in a way it's like all these hurdles that can come up, we're kind of you know, deflating all these different hurdles so that we can continue to, to progress. So that we'll be coming back to this theme for sure. So um, as I was saying before, we're not just merely paying attention to the mechanical in entering and exiting of air, how is it that we can lean into some of these pleasant qualities uh, or uh, the other mental factors? So forgive me for jumping ahead, but ultimately we'll see that these exercises all kind of collapse and reinforce each other. So I'll be using some of the terminologies of future exercises for different ones. So right here, this circle represents the breath as it has this circuitous nature. It just has this way of keep going. So on this darker, oops, on this darker, on this darker um, part of the square there, that represents kind of the first half of the breath, the in-breath, the top of the in-breath. This lighter side is the more of the out-breath. How's that, you know, the, or the second half, the breathing out and the base of the out-breath. So the base and the top, that's kind of the pause. You know? So in breath, I'm breathing in. And then when I naturally get to the top of my breath, I'm not pushing it or holding it. I just notice that there's this transition. I'm no longer breathing in. And then I move into the breathing out. And I naturally bottom out. And then I move it to breathing in. So we're not trying to extend uh, uh, in the big picture, but just being aware of these different kind of four points of the breath. And each of them might have their own pleasant qualities. So uh, many people report on the first half of the breath. Um, there's some pleasant energizing qualities. There might be a particular energy, particular joyful, pleasant hedonic tone, certain oxygen pleasure of our air needs being met. Top of the in-breath, some people report, oh, there's a wakeful uh, quality there. There's this kind of fullness. There's this particular kind of energy there that's present. You know? So just notice what's what's in the different points of the breath, what are the things that you notice that might be, uh, what they might refer on this side, the gladdening effect of breath. Whereas on the second half of the breath, they might refer to more as the, the balancing aspect of breath. On that out breath, most people report a relaxation response inherently is available. There's this potential inclining towards rest, relinquishing or letting go. On the base of the out breath, some people report a sense of tranquility equanimity, acceptance, peace. Yeah. So part of it is the air, but also noticing well, what's, what's, what kind of gladdening, balancing qualities? What are some of the pleasant things that happen? Uh, and for most of us, that's gonna be very subtle. It's gonna be very fleeting. It's gonna be here a moment and gone. That's okay. Uh, this is cultivation. So we're looking for kind of the green shoots, the, the, the young little pieces of grass that are coming through the ground here. Uh, just be happy when they show up. Um, so, of course, I'll be guiding us, but um, I just wanted to put, put out this little illustration of ways that we can kind of lean into the breath in a way that it, it um, can respond and open up to us the more that we can open up to it with a curiosity. Yeah. Okay. Right, good. Um, so, um, Having said that, uh, shall we actually do a little bit of sitting practice? Yeah. Okay, so allow yourself to come to a comfortable upright position. Allow yourself to straighten up and settle in.
Traditionally, they talk about starting off with a narrow focus. Uh, many people assert that uh, the traditional practice is bringing your attention to the frenum or that divot below the nose there. Some people interpret this as paying attention to the nostrils, but this narrow focus on breath. So anchoring your attention to a part of the body that is actively breathing. So if you want to be a little bit more open about it, any part of the body, the nose, the throat, the lungs, the belly, different teachers do it accordingly. Just anchor your attention to one part of the body that is engaged in breathing. So the first exercise, breathing in long, one discerns I'm breathing in long. Breathing out long, one discerns I'm breathing out long. If you care to, you can lengthen your breath a little bit. Really draw out the breath. As long as it's still comfortable now. And just allow yourself to notice what are some of these pleasant grounding qualities that can be discerned as we engage in this long, lengthy, in and out breath. The second exercise, breathing in short, one discerns I'm breathing in short, breathing out short, one discerns I'm breathing out short. What is it like to truncate that breath? Intentionally make it a bit shallower, a little shorter. Is that pleasant, unpleasant? to still discern particular qualities or does it shift the overall relationship with breath?
third exercise. One trains oneself, I will breathe in sensitive to the entire body. One trains oneself, I will breathe out sensitive to the entire body. So one interpretation is a referring to the full body of breath. So allow your breath to just be natural. Can we focus? What are the different qualities we can discern? For a few rounds of breath, focus more on the inhale. Don't shift or change it, but just pay particular attention to the in-breath. What are some of the pleasant qualities that are to be found there? Can you give yourself permission to feel them? next few rounds, can we pay particular attention to that top of the in-breath, that pause that happens naturally as we're ending the in-breath before we fully breathe out? What happens in that moment of transition for you? Pay attention, particularly for the next few rounds, that pause at the top of the in-breath. Good. Next few rounds, can you focus more on that out breath? What pleasant qualities are available there? The relaxation response, the letting go, whatever it is for you, notice it, give yourself permission to feel that.
the next few rounds, can you focus primarily on what occurs at the base of the out-breath, that transition between breathing out before you breathe in again? Notice what is pleasant. Give yourself permission to feel that. Another interpretation of paying attention to this full body of breath is can we expand the scope of focus now, not to just one small region of anchoring our attention to the breath, but open up your awareness to include this full feeling form of the body. How is it that the breath is felt in the full feeling form of the body? How is the full body of breath felt in the fullness of your own body? The fourth exercise, one trains oneself, I'll breathe in, focusing on calming bodily fabrications and trains oneself, I'll breathe out, focusing on calming bodily fabrications. So what are the unpleasant qualities taking place in form, posture, sensations in the body? Rather than being distracted, deterred, put off by them, on one hand, be leaning firmly into this shamatha, leaning firmly into this cultivating of a calm abiding. On the other hand, just contacting these sensations lightly, loosely, bringing a sense of acceptance, openness, equanimity, and ease. Letting go, relinquishing any holding, grasping, relinquishing any craving aversion, just bringing a sense of a nurturing warmth. To 
towards the regions of solidity and contraction in the body. And an overall just awareness of the shamatha quality that we are cultivating. Any qualities of calming, cooling out, and overall gladdening and balancing of this abiding in the body. To whatever degree it may be there, be it subtle or fleeting or well-established, just acknowledge and appreciate. everybody. I'd like to mention uh, this idea of a post-bell practice, so allowing part of your awareness to still be reserved internally to continue to, uh, to leave yourself open to receive the merits of what you've been cultivating. So I invite everybody to have some spaciousness around that. I'm going to Pause the recording right now so we can move into uh, question and answer mode. Okay, so thank you everybody for your uh, attention, uh, your willingness to participate uh, in this evening's class. I really appreciate the dialogue and the discourse. Um, you guys are really uh, paying attention and uh, applying these. So um, that does my heart good. Uh, so I'd like to end with a dedication of merit. Uh, by the merits of these acts and other such virtues, may we attain a liberation for the benefit of all beings. We bow before those who come before us on the path, to those who come after us on the path, and to those who walk beside us on the path. Okay, thank you so much, folks. Uh, I'll get together, uh, get a, a Google Classroom together, and I'll, I'll get that information out to everybody for the next go around. Uh, otherwise, um, you could uh, go to YouTube and just uh, look me up, Michael Zatel. You could probably also put in meditation or mindfulness. That'll link you to me, not uh, others who share my name. Uh, and, and the recording will hopefully be up in the next couple of days. Uh, otherwise, there's other um, recordings that are up there to help people with um, uh, their meditation. And um, yeah, hope to see everybody next week. Take care. Thanks.